Um, all right, so I threw a few, a couple statistics up here just about myself. If you guys want to find me anywhere, that's where you can find me. Uh, there's my email address, LinkedIn. Probably shouldn't have put my date of birth or the year I was born whenever I put that in there. It's starting to get a little bit something I want to hide as the years roll by. But anyway, there, there you go. You know how old I am. Um, uh, also, I work for a company called Exit Certified. If you're not familiar with us, we're an authorized AWS training partner. So I'm an AWS authorized instructor. Uh, but I'm not here delivering auth authorized training, just to make that clear. I'm just kind of here uh, just showing you guys a little bit about serverless. Um, a little bit about myself. I've been doing computing for over 30 years. I got started in the Marine Corps. Um, and that was simply because I could type real fast, and that was about it. Uh, and so I knew WordStar could type real fast. I started to learn all the stuff they needed me to do as far as running their networks, and I've been doing it really for about 30 years now. So uh, as far as AWS ex experience, I've been doing that since 2009. Uh, at that time, I was teaching PeopleSoft. It's a full stack uh, environment, CRM, uh, supply chain kind of, kind of thing. Uh, I was teaching that, and um, I decided to build out a full stack, uh, a PeopleSoft environment in AWS and allow each one of my students to have one of those environments. So I separated myself from Oracle University by doing that and kicked their ass. And so um, basically we started our own company, and, uh, and that's kind of where I got started with cloud and AWS. And then I got into blockchain, so you'll see down there that I do some blockchain work too. So I work with a company in um, South Bend called Simba Chain. If you're not familiar with them, we have a contract with the Air Force and with the Navy to do track and trace for sustainability for the parts and supplies that they have in their supply chain. So, uh, and then also my company is nomagicjustlogic.com. So anyway, that's all about me. But what are we going to do today? We're going to talk about serverless and uh, ser what a serverless app looks like. How did, it, how did you do that? And we're going to do a little bit of code review of the serverless app that I've built out for you guys. So when we think about what serverless is, let's just traditionally think about all the work that's involved in order to get computing to work, right? So traditionally, we have four subsystems. We have compute, we have memory, we have storage, and we have networking, right? And then we got to throw some security on top of that. And so traditionally, if I have to build all that out, I have to have a serving environment, I have to have a set of servers, I have to have... Uh, a set of resources, I either have to lease that from the local IT center or I have to build out my own room, I have to have a robotic arm. I have all this stuff that I have to do just to sell cars, just to do whatever I need to do, just to manage your medical records, just to do whatever I need to do in order to be able to maintain data. So. The important thing that you have to remember when you look at serverless and when you think of workloads that you might move to serverless is you have to think about how much does that workload currently cost me and how, how much would it cost me in the cloud. A lot of times people will move to AWS and they'll do what we call a lift and shift and they'll just take their existing infrastructure and they'll just plop it in and they'll think that they're going to save money, and they don't, and they're mad because they got this huge bill. And the reason is, is because they're not planning appropriately. And so you have to look at your workloads, and you got to figure out what works best for you in order to be a serverless workload. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you kind of what a serverless app looks like. And so with that, we have to cover those things. We have to have a security piece. We have to have a storage piece. We have to have a compute piece. And we have to have a way to reference all this stuff, right? And so I'm going to walk through the code of a small little serverless app that we've built out that you can go in and take a look at. The code's on GitHub. Um, but it's a serverless app that's basically just a slot machine. So let's just take a look at it. And let's kind of talk about what the slot machine's doing. And then we'll look at the code. So if I come out here and I look at this little slot machine, holy cow, it looks just like a regular old slot machine. I spin it, dun, 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 I get my reels, it gives me some data back, right? And so there's some, some cool things that are happening here. It's just simply a style sheet that has some randomness built into it that's throwing up some reels that are showing me some random numbers, and that's then telling me whether or not I'm a winner. So in order for me to be able to build out this app, I have to be able to have all of this uh, uh, code in the background that's doing the randomness for the reels, which is in JavaScript. And then I, got to, I have to have the ability to orchestrate this application, which is done in Python. And so the storage of all of this is in an S3 bucket. If you're not familiar with S3, it's where we provide serverless storage in AWS. If you want to talk about cheap storage, 
S3 has serverless storage and S3 standard in, in Ohio, the closest region to us, for less than three cents a gig. That's cheap. That's a three cents a gig per month, but that's really, really cheap. I mean, if you think about that storage cost and having the durability and reliability that you get from an S3 storage, you can't, you can't get cheaper than that. You cannot do that cheaper in your, in your data center, right? And so think about a workload that we've all stressed on that could go serverless, okay? How many of you had to do a backup? You ever had to change the backup tapes? I've changed the backup tapes. Have you ever forgot to change the backup tape? <laughs> Never. I have, right? And then you sweat all day long, right? You just sweat about that all day long. And so that's what we call undifferentiated heavy lifting. But how can I take that and move it into an automated process? What kinds of processes are within our workloads? And we've done that already with, with automated arms or you go to, you know, you go to Glacier or Glacier Cold Storage or whatever. But um, there's a lot of ways that you can deal with that type of workload and automate that so you never have to change a tape. And you can use AWS Glacier to do that. And it's completely serverless. And it's just a little iSCSI tape device you plug in there wherever you got to back up some data. So that's a really easy, low-hanging fruit workload that's serverless that you could take advantage of. But let's take a look at this little app here. So let me tell you a little bit about the app, first of all. I'm going to show you a few things today. I'm going to be talking about Cognito, which is going to be the security piece behind this. It's going to provide the authorizations and the authentications in order for us to be able to call the code that's going to give us the randomness to produce this, this wheel. Uh, we're going to call a Lambda function. We're going to have two of those that we're going to be calling. Lambda is serverless compute. So instead of me managing a Python server or me managing a JavaScript server, I just have this com code that I, that's completely asynchronous that I just simply call that's in the cloud, and, uh, and it runs that code for me. And when you run a Lambda function, there's some limitations to it because I just can't have a a global compute computer that I can just run a function on and maybe run a denial of service attack on. So we have to throttle that down somehow. I'll show you how that works. Um, and then we're going to show you how the storage works. So we're going to show you kind of where is all this hosted? Where is this physically stored at? Like, and so that's going to be this S3 bucket that we use, or the simple storage network. So with that being said, Let's go out and we're going to take a look at the code. And so right here, this is what's called cloud formation. If you're not familiar with cloud formation, what cloud formation does for us is it allows us to do what we call continuous integration and continuous development. So what that means is, is that we're just taking uh, our infrastructure and we're adapting what we've been using continuously for development and we're using it so that we can do infrastructure as code. So I've defined all the infrastructure for that app as code in a cloud formation template, and I'm just going to walk through this cloud formation template and explain to you what is in that app, and then we'll go back and look at it again. So this cloud formation template here, uh, um, it creates all of these resources. So these are all the resources that are actually created. But let's go out here in Visual Studio and take a look at the code. So here in, v in Visual Studio, I'm just going to make this a little bigger so you guys can re see this a little better. That's probably good enough. All right, so, um, so what, I, what I've done here is in, in this cloud formation template, at the beginning of the cloud formation template, I have to define the parameters that are going to be used in that particular template. So here what I've done is um, I just defined the S3 bucket, and then the name of the S3 bucket is the called slot machine. Cool. And then inside of that slot machine, I, then I'm going to create my resources. So there's the first bucket that I create. And so in that bucket, if you're familiar with an S3 bucket, you can host a static website. So this is what I did is I defined through key value pairs in a YAML file. I defined uh, all the variables or all the parameters that I need for the S3 bucket that made it a public bucket and then also uh, marked the index.html file as the home page for that website that would be referenced as you would reference the endpoint, which would be the URL for that S3 bucket. Cool. So then when I come in here, I can take a look at all of the security. So I'm not going to go through all of this real quick, but I'll show you a couple of these. I'll show you a couple of these policies because everybody kind of is curious about what a policy is. So in AWS, we have these things called policies that allow you to control um, the permission piece, basically. Uh, and so you can create basically three types of policies. You're going to create either an identity policy, which would mean you're attaching it to an individual, and then you're defining what that individual can do. Uh, or you 
you're going to create a resource policy, which would be I'm attaching it to the resource, just like this, an S3 bucket. And then I'm defining who can access that S3 bucket. So I'm doing it a little bit differently, but I'm still defining the same thing. Uh, or I could define what's called a service control policy, which would be where I want to make more um, uh, control over what individuals are able to do within my AWS account. Because remember, all we're doing is we're just paying for your ability to use resources in the cloud. We're just renting Andy Jassy's computer, right? That's all we're doing. All right, so, um, so, so when we come in here and we take a look, we're just seeing what's called an ERP statement. Uh, I call it an ERP statement because it's effect, action, resource, principle, and condition. Uh, and so E-A-R-P-C. So the effect is always either going to be allow or deny anytime that you do a policy uh, statement. So I'm doing an allow. On the S3 bucket, I'm doing allow you to do gets so you can read the data from the bucket, and that's what we want. And then we got to go back and we got to figure out well, where that bucket is, and the resource is the ARN. And so that stands for the Amazon resource name, so it's going to reference what we saw back at the beginning in the header parameters. And so the principle is who's going to be able to access this particular resource. And so that's going to be anybody can access the resource. And then I didn't put any conditions in place, but this is where you would have your if-then-else statement. All right, and so the next piece that you'll see here is I have what's cre I've created what's called a Cognito Identity Pool. And I'll show you what it is uh, after I explain to, what, explain to you what I've done. And so in order for you to be able to use this application, you're using it from a web. And so I want to provide unauthenticated web users the ability to call my Lambda function. And so in order to do that, I leverage what's called Cognito. And Cognito allows me to aggregate users into a grouping, and then I can assign permissions to those users with an identity pool. So I'm going to use a user pool and an identity pool in order to do that security chunk there. So, um, so anyway, that's what I did here. So I created a, um, an identity pool here that, uh, that just say, basically says that uh, I'm allowing unauthenticated identities in. And since I turned that value on, then anybody can call my code. Sweet. So, um, so then I come down here, and so then I have this role in order to be able to call the Lambda function. So same thing. It's just giving me the permissions that I need in order to be able to call the code. So let's go down and actually take a look at the code. So um, I'm going to skip down a little bit to the actual code that we're running for our Lambda. So there's two Lambda functions that we're calling for compute here. So the first uh, compute function that we have is for the slot machine. So remember the slot machine, it was just the index handler file, right? So this is the handler file that creates that index.html file that's in my S3 bucket. So whenever we come in here and we take a look at this, we see that this, this is a zip file, and it has inside of it, it has where it's pulling in a variable that's the face cards that are going to be displayed within the game, and it's all those, those, those images that we just saw in the game right there. So we got the hearts and the spades and the what jack hearts or whatever. And so then down here we see our math. So here we, well, here's, here we see what we're going to be displaying in our, in our wheels. So this is what we're going to be displaying as our output from that input. And then here's our math down here. So here's all of our math that's telling us whether or not we're a minute winner, and then whether, and so we can see that, you know, every three slot pulls, then we're at the, actually right above there, we're improving our results by 33% with that uh, step function. So anyway, with this, I'm just improving your results. So every three times you pull the thing, you might want to increase your bet because, you know, it's going to win better or something. So, so anyway, that's, that's, that's just the code. Simple, but um, anyway, it's just JavaScript. So the cool thing about that is that JavaScript is just a simple endpoint that I'm using to call, and I'll show you that here in a minute if you want. And so then I have to set this up. So in order for this application to get set up, I got some Python code. So by the way, I didn't show you in my Lambda for the uh, slot machine. Let's just look at the header of the Lambda. So whenever you define a Lambda, check this out. Remember I said that you had to ensure that you're not over-utilizing over the global compute resources? So for this Lambda, I'm setting my max time to run for four minutes. So if that wheel spins for more than four minutes, it's timed out, right? Uh, but, you know, the max memory that I can use is 128 meg, and that's across the board for all Lambda functions. You can't go over 128 meg for any Lambda. Um, in addition to that, the timeout for a Lambda is 15 minutes. So if you have a function that runs for longer than 15 minutes, you're going to have to chunk it down. 
and get it to run, long, run in, shorter, in shorter workloads and make it more asynchronous. So um, anyway, I can give another talk about that if you don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, so, um, so, anyway this, so what we're doing here is we're just chunking this down. And, um, and on this setup one, we're saying, okay, well, this one, it could, it could take 15 minutes for that one to run, and that's okay. So we're not, we're not giving it that throttling threshold that we did for the first one. So we're running it. Also, we notice that we get to define when we set up a Lambda, we define the runtime environment. And then, of course, we define the handler just like we did before. So this time, instead of setting this up with JavaScript, now this is the setup of my actual application. So what we're doing here is we're going through and we're importing all of the information, everything that I need in order for this application to work. And so you can kind of see where we've kind of defined our entry points for our Lambda handlers. We've, we've got our CloudFormation request. Uh, we defined all the information for the request type and our identity pools. This is basically the URL that, it, that it's going to generate and all of the security pieces that it's going to generate based on um, you know, what we just set up. And so, uh, and then, so if then, you know, and then this is kind of our rollback. So if, uh, you know, if it, if it runs into any problems, then it can go ahead and roll back in this uh, condition statement at the, bit, at the bit end. Um, and then last pieces we have is just a little bit more with our security. So for a role assignment. So real quick, if you're not familiar with what roles do in AWS, um, a role is basically a really interesting thing. It's kind of like, I was a Marine for like six years, and so I was on, a, I was on an aircraft carrier, and this is the best way I can explain this. Um, on the aircraft carrier, I had to wear a white float coat. It told everybody that I was an operations guy. If I would have walked over and picked up a bomb and tried to load it up on one of my aircraft, somebody should tackle me, right? And that's operational procedure because I shouldn't be touching ordnance unless I'm an ordnance man. And that qualifies me as an ordnance man by the coat that I'm wearing. So you can think of a role, when you think of a role in AWS, think of it just like in my float coat. It's, it's qualifying me to be able to do something, right? So when you take on a role in AWS, so what this role is, is I'm taking on a role so I can do something, right? So I'm taking on a role so I can call the Lambda function. And all that role does is allow you to call the Lambda function. So interestingly enough, instead of me just applying that role to a user, maybe Calvin, or maybe a group of users, his whole team, uh, that's a principle, I can also assign it to another resource. So I could say, hey, I could say this EC2 instance can call this S3 bucket, right, through this, through this statement. And so that's why we, we leverage roles quite a bit in AWS in our security chunk, because it gives us the ability to, pl to apply uh, those security privileges not only to an individual, a group of individuals, or, but we can also do it to another resource. So we can allow basically the resources to talk to themselves. Um, so anyway, that's what we did there. Um, so, and then I create a custom resource policy uh, so that we can go ahead and get all the security chunk out of here. So this is my ERP statement. So if we just look at this, I just do a, an allow to do, to do, this is so that I can get logs. And so this is going into my logs group. And so I'm doing a put list and delete into my logs. And so this is just giving me the ability to ensure that I get a, a good log of everything. And then, um, and then here is my, uh, my other, let's see, this is my web helper that gets created. Oh, this is my output um, um, for where all of this is at. So if you want it, this is where all this, uh, this JavaScript for this slots machine, all the assets, that's where all that's at right there. And so that's, um, it's, in the, it's in the S3, or excuse me, it's in the AWS um, examples, GitHub repo, and so that's where I pulled this out of. So, so anyway, you guys can go pull that out of there if you want to. Um, anyway, so then it just pulls out, and then, at the, then it just defines the outputs that it creates after we spin up this stack. So in essence, this stack, again, it's just a YAML file. Um, one of the, let me show you real quick one of the cool things about this, too, is, is um, if you ever use uh, CloudFormation, which is basically the ability for us to stand up all these resources at once with the code that I just showed you, um, if you don't want to do it in YAML, which is what I was showing you, and you like JSON, which is, you know, maybe a lot of people want to use JSON, uh, you can use JSON too, because at CloudFormation, actually a CloudFormation template uh, will actually allow you to load this up in JSON as well as YAML. So uh, either one of those will work. But, um, but anyway, I'll show you how that works real quick, and then I'll also show you the lambdas, and then I'll 
ask you guys if you have any questions. So um, real quick, uh, this is the stat. This is just the uh, interface for this tool. So I don't know how familiar you guys are with AWS, but basically there's three ways that we can interface with everything. I'm showing this through the th through the uh, console, but ch generally speaking, you'll probably code everything that I'm showing you. So uh, you'll use this through the SDK. So everything I'm showing you, you can do all this through the SDK or the CLI. So anyway, um, so. If I go back here to CloudFormation, one of the cool things that you can do here is if you go in and you want to create a new stack of a bunch of resources, um, you can go out and you could download like one of those CloudFormation stacks like I showed you from a GitHub repo from AWS and just do it that way. Um, and so I, I encourage you to do that, by the way. Um, or uh, if you want, you, know, you can go ahead and import if you already know what you have, right? And so you could import it. Uh, and, and then you yeah, have this other really cool thing here, which is one of my favorites, is the um, CloudFormation um, designer and the template designer. So let me show this to you real quick. But this is really awesome because, um, actually, you know what? I'm going to do it a little differently. Um, I'm going to upload a YAML file into this designer so that you can see. Um, I didn't. I didn't bring one with me. That's okay. You know what? You know what I'll do. I know another way to get one. It's better. Uh, I'll do it this way. So if I go back, one of the other things that is nice about a cloud formation is you can just pick from one of the delivered templates. So that's what I'll do. Is um, I'll use a sample template. And so you know, if you guys are already working, for instance, on a, on a LAMP stack, or you were working with WordPress or something like that, and you just want to build that out, then fine. It'll go ahead and just start building out that template for you. Um, and then you can, oops, let me go back to previous here. You can view this in what's called the template designer. And so the, if you're new to YAML or if you're new to JSON, um, one of the, this is one of the really cool ways to just kind of learn this is like, oh, this is pretty simple, but um, here's, the, here's the code down here at the bottom, just like I was walking you guys through. Uh, here's your code down here. But as you select the objects, it's kind of like a Visio, ob, a Visio designer here, so you can actually see the, um, the resources that you've selected there in your CloudFormation template. Uh, you see this visual editor. And then you can see the objects selected down here, and you can redefine the parameters that you're using. So in this particular example, it's a web server security group. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with the security group, but basically it's where you're defining firewall rules for your in individual resource. So like for an EC2 instance, I'm saying, hey, I'm letting HTTP traffic come in through 443 and 80, that kind of thing, from anywhere. So, uh, so anyway, that's what they're doing. So they're saying, hey, I'm letting IP traffic come in from port 80 uh, from anywhere, right there. That's what they did with that side annotation. So that's it. So anyway, um, so it's a really cool tool if you're not familiar with infrastructure as code to use, but, um, but it allows you to leverage a lot of the serverless architecture templates that are built into AWS um, that, that you might want to use for an existing workload. So uh, what I like to say is, is, you know, when I'm talking to, to, to people that are new to AWS is, you know, don't try to reinvent the wheel and start from the beginning. Find a good jump off point. Figure out a good template that's already there, that's, you know, something that's already working for something similar to your existing workload, and hack it together, right? You know, that works a little better, uh, you know, in order to get a proof of concept going, right? Now, you don't want to do that with your production workloads, but of course, that's a good way in order to get a proof of concept going. And then from there, you can go ahead and move into minimal viable product. So, with that being said, well, why do we want to go serverless? Well, let's just take a look. Let's just take a look. Um, if you look on that list, there's a lot of servers. There's a lot of services that are up there, and a lot of those services are probably services that we can't afford to adopt. Right? I can't afford to adopt a, a satellite. I can't launch a satellite, but I might be able to, you know, interface with LoRaWAN, a low-power radio and wide-area network, and actually shoot to a, to a satellite every 16 minutes that flies over me and exchange data, I can do that. And if I wanted to do that, it's right here. Well, holy cow, man. 
that's a lot of, what about a farmer? How could he interface now and share data from his tractor, for instance? You know? So there's a lot of different applications that you can think of you know, when you just start looking at your ability to democratize all of those advanced technologies. There is something up there that you can probably take advantage of in your existing workloads. And how are you going to do it? Dirt serverless. I mean, I can't, I mean, you're not going to be able to pick up all that work. You're not going to be able to go buy an IoT infrastructure and do all that. But if you go with Greengrass and buy a couple Raspberry Pis and get some sensors and start looking at data and data points and running it through a machine learning algorithm, you're going to build out some really cool stuff. I'll tell you guys a little bit of a, about a project that I'm working on with some students at IUPUI, and then I'll open it up for questions. But what we're doing at IUPUI, I got uh, 10 students uh, that are working on their capstone project, and we're trying to interface machine learning, AI, blockchain, and IoT in order for our Department of Natural Resources to have a better handle on the data that we're bringing in, out, of our, out of our rivers and lakes. And so with that project, I mean, that's pretty awesome. And it's, I mean, we're just doing it as a, as a project for a, for a capstone project, but as I told them, they'll probably, if they do a good job, they might get some sponsorship, so, yeah. Um, I'll have to look at my list, but maybe, yeah. Uh, I'm working with Dr. Lee, Dr., uh, Dr. John Lee. Yeah, yeah. If people have questions, we'll use the microphone, so we sure. can use the live stream. Perfect. Yeah, I'm, I'm done, by the way, if you guys have any questions. Okay, so if actually, if anybody has questions for Tommy, let's uh, hit him up here. Sure, absolutely. Any questions on serverless and AWS? None? Did I do that good of a job? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, here, let me get the mic run. So um, <clears throat> if I understand your application, sure. uh, you have the client-side JavaScript mm -hmm. um, using a Cognito user mm -hmm. to call the Server-side JavaScript, yeah. OK. Yeah. So, so, um, <clears throat> so it, it's using the Cognito credentials to call um, the Lambda. Yes. Um, as right. opposed to having the, a, a client-side um, JavaScript right. call, like, API gateway, like the Lambda through an API, like, so you're using Cognito user rather than API gateway. Yes. Can you tell me why you made that choice? I did not make that choice. Oh, okay. It's a design decision that was made for this, for this just little, oh, okay. yeah. It's, it's actually, it's a AWS, it, like I was saying, it's in their GitHub repos. Oh, so sure. it's just an example that they provide to us to give for a serverless lecture. <clears throat> so, okay. yeah. So I, I don't own that code. Yeah, I, right. I, I do say that when you know yeah. when I talk. If, if it, you but. had to speculate, um, I would say that the chances are is when you use an API gateway. So the interesting thing about an API gateway is is an API gateway is going to um, allow you to expose anything that you have internally. But I don't have anything internally. All I have is a lambda function, and so why do I need to expose anything? There's nothing to expose. It's just a lambda function. And so in order to control the um, security on that lambda function, I can manage that simply through a role and a policy statement. And so that would be my guess on why they did that. But I, I would have to talk to the architect. OK, yeah. thank you. Any other questions for Tommy? I had a question. It, sure. I wanted a clarification. When you first brought up your YAML file and you're showing up the Lambdas and you had the mm -hmm. JavaScript Lambda, you had it specified for a uh, maximum execution time of four minutes and yep. then you had 128 megabytes of RAM. But you said across all Lambdas. I think that's just for each invocation of, the lambda, of that Lambda, correct? Yes, yes. So each time that you invoke that particular Lambda, it can run for up to 15 minutes, yeah. Yeah, and so. for that amount of memory, correct? Yes. That's, that's not right. capping like every, no, every invocation no. yes, globally. Yeah. yeah, it's for each instantiation of the Lambda, you have that amount of resources. Okay. Yeah. Is that the same amount of memory regardless of the language type? Or does yeah, it it's 128 max for the Lambda engine. So the Lambda API maxes out 128. So even as they add other, other, you know, if they add Plutus or Rust or something like that, you know, it'll still be 128. So that's set to run at four minutes. If it runs less than that, then maybe you could speak to like how that's built. So if it was, if it, so then you would just have to put a webhook in place to say that at that point, in order to have some type of recovery function, there's nothing in it currently. 
Um, so the four minutes, uh, when it times out, it just uh, it kills the Lambda function, and it writes to the API that it killed that Lambda, and it didn't run to completion, and it rolls everything back. So um, You're asking if, about if it ran for less than four minutes, right? Anything that exceeds the parameters, yeah. yeah. But you, so. you pay for actual execution time, not the maximum execution time, correct? Right, for a Lambda, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's why, you know, when you're spinning that wheel, you know, you wouldn't want it to be paying for 15 minutes if it was out. Yeah. Quick question. Did the roulette pay out in Bitcoin? <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah, that would be a good application. Yeah. Now, if you think about that, now here's an interesting thing, though. If you were to take Kubernetes and the Kubernetes cluster and you were to, and you were to certify it and then you were to validate it through, uh, through just an MD5 hash, you could stand that up. And you could have a portable endpoint that you just need to point to that then could pay out based on the odds that was put in. So, yeah, you could. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Any other questions, Tommy? Awesome. Well, let's give a big round of applause. Thanks for coming here today in the AWS. Thanks, guys.